Okay, hi everybody, thank you for coming. And uh, tonight's share is uh, dedicated uh, for a Rafua Shlema for Brea Bat Chava and the Aliyat Neshama of Yoel Ben Avraham. We hope again that uh, the learning should be both Aliyat Neshama and Rafua Shlema uh, to Brea Bat Chava, as well as all of the Chola Yisrael and those who are Baruch Hashem. Uh, healthy should uh, should Vada remain so. Um, I hope everyone also had a very rewarding and wonderful uh, Shavuos, a time of Matan Torah. Uh, there is a famous thought that's expressed that Shavuos is called the day that we were given the Torah. It is not the day that we received the Torah. And without getting into the chronological issues we spoke about last week, the point is this. The giving of the Torah may have been a specific event at a specific time. But the accepting of the Torah is something you do every single day. It's not possible to talk about the day that I accepted the Torah. Because every single day I must re-accept the Torah. Just as, you know, you don't say I don't have to eat breakfast today because I ate it yesterday. Every single day there has to be a sense of renewal and a sense of rededication. Uh, you're not simply a Jew today because you were a Jew yesterday. You're a Jew today because you have decided I'm going to be a Jew today. In fact, this is why people say the morning brachos are expressed in the negative. You know, thank you, our God, who did not make me a Gentile. Why don't you say, made me a Jew? Why don't you emphasize the positive? The answer is because God, in a deep sense, does not make you a Jew. By not making you a Gentile, he enables you to be a Jew. But you become a Jew by the decisions that you make in living your life. Okay? God, may, uh, God gives you the potential to become a Jew, but you have the responsibility to do so. In fact, there's a very, very moving... Uh, well, everything in, everything in the Sefer is moving. The last Hasidic Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto was of Clonimus Kalman Shapiro. Uh, who's known as the H. Kodesh, the Holy Fire, uh, the Piazetsna Rebbe he was. Piazetsna was a little town next to Warsaw. And he was in the Warsaw Ghetto and he lived through it and then at the very end he was deported to a concentration camp and he died. And in the middle of the Warsaw Ghetto he continued to teach and inspire. And the few people who survived, uh, children who remember his Suda Shalishit for children, uh, which lasted th two or three hours uh, into the night, they say that somehow he managed to transport them into another world, that uh, their world was one of starvation, fear, death, murder, disease. And for those three hours, they were in another world. He somehow created an alternative existence, a deeper existence, a richer existence. And really one of the most inspiring people, you know, in, in Jewish history almost. They're just an amazing, amazing, amazing person. And uh, the notes of his Holocaust shiurim were published in a sefer called Eish Kodesh, The Holy Fire. It's available in he English translation as well. So go to Amazon and uh, look at it. And I think, uh, you know, you'll be quite, quite amazed and moved by the power of his ability to create a connection to God, even in the darkest moments of life. So he writes there in one of his diary entries, he actually writes, as he's approaching Rosh Hashanah, what does he want to be? He says, listen, what, 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 you know, he, Torah, he learns a lot of Torah, he said, I do mitzvahs. What is it that I seek from God that I don't all, already do? He said, I want to be a Jew. Not a Rebbe, and not a Rabbi, and not a Talmud Chacham, and not a great person. I just want to be a Jew. And he says, that's what I'm missing, he felt. He felt that he didn't hit that simple, basic connection of being a Jew. And that's why, again, 
uh, we don't call Shavuos the day that we receive the Torah because we have to receive it every single day. So be as Rat Hashem, I hope that all of us will merit that Kabbalat HaTorah will continue to be nimshechet, continue to go on into really every single day of our lives. Because after all, the ultimate point of sacred time, whether it's a Shabbos or a Yom Tov, is that the sacred time infuses the mundane with a sense of the sublime and a sense of the holy. Meaning, part of why Shabbat is special is because it also transforms the weekday. If it doesn't transform the weekday, there was something defective in the way we kept the Shabbos. And that is true for every Yom Tov and every Chag as well. There has to be a carryover into the week. But what I want to do today, again, Shavuos kind of interrupted our sequence, I actually want to speak about something that is connected to last week's Parsha, Parsha Snaso. And the reason is that Parsha Snaso, most years, is normally read after Shavuos. This year was a little bit of an anomaly, so I'm giving myself, uh, so to speak, poetic license to speak about it the way it's positioned in the normal uh, course of the calendar. But in Chutzlars, right? And in Chutzlars, uh, that's quite, oh yes, and also we, we oh, that's, that's even a better excuse. Uh, in Chutzlars, they're reading Parsha Snaso this week. So this will be a Parsha, especially for the Chutzlars people, but the Eretz Yisrael people are invited to, to listen in. And that is, uh, the beginning of, par of Sefer Bamidbar generally, Parsha Bamidbar, Parsha Snaso, and even Parsha Balosa, is setting up the encampment of the Jewish people in the desert. And the Sifre Hasidah see in this a symbolic way of creating an ideal society of holiness. So let's take even technical details to illustrate this. The tribe of Levi is divided into three sub-tribes based on the three sons of Levi. Gershon, Kahas, Merari. Kahas had a son Amram, and Amram had two sons, Moshe and Aaron, and one daughter Miriam but Gershon, Kahas, and Merari. And each of these subgroupings were assigned a special responsibility in the transportation of the Mishkan. Kahas were assigned the carrying of the Ark, the Aron HaKodesh, the Mizbeach, the two altars, uh, the Shulchan, the golden table. And they did not use wagons. They had to carry it on their shoulders. And they are described as Kodesh Kedashim. Gershon transported largely what you might call the tapestries, the cloths of the Mishkan, uh, the various roofing materials, and they carried them in wagons. Merari had physically the most demanding job. They were carrying these big heavy beams. Now granted, they put it on wagons as well, but they had to load it on the wagons. Right? So Gershon, Kahas, and Merari each of them is given, as a sub-tribe, specific assignments in how the Mishkan would be transported. Rav Sadok writes that Perkei Avos tells us, Al Shlosha Devarim Ha'olam Omet, the world rests on three fundamental pillars, on the study of Torah, on divine service through prayer and sacrifice, and Gemilas Chasadim, loving kindness and benevolence. We know that the three patriarchs represent these three pillars. Avram represents the pillar of loving kindness. Yitzchak, who was willing to be a sacrifice to God, is the pillar of avoda. And Yaakov, who spent 14 years of uninterrupted learning of Torah in the yeshiva of Shem and Aver, he represents uh, Torah. So Rav Sadiq wants to say that the three subdivisions of Shevet Levi who are the servants of God, represent Torah, Avoda, Gemilas Chasadim. Now in the case of Kahas, the association with Torah is fairly simple. Kahas carried the Aron HaKodesh. The Aron HaKodesh is the container, is the repository of Torah. So Kahas represents the spiritual impulse of Am Yisrael that finds its expression in Torah. And that's called Kodesh Kedashim, because although the world stands on three pillars, and you need three pillars, the Gemara says if a person thinks the only thing that's important is learning Torah, 
he doesn't even have Torah. The Gemara says, Kala Omer, ain't the Torah? Any person that says, all I need is Torah? Afilu Torah ain't bo. He doesn't have Torah either. So it's a Dover Pashat. You need Torah, Avoda, Gemilas, Chasadim. And if within a yeshiva setting you don't have an emphasis on Avoda and Gemilas, Chasad, the Torah itself is missing. You need three. At the same time, though, although you need three, Torah is considered to be the most important of the three. And the reason that's so is that from Torah you will come or can come to the other ones. The other ones will not necessarily bring you to Torah. And as when I learn Torah, I see from the Torah how important davening is and how important loving kindness is. So the Torah will bring me to those other things. On the other hand, if all I do is gemilos chesed and kindness, that doesn't make me understand a tosvos or a ramban, as it were. I'm not going to come to Torah from chesed, but I can come to chesed from Torah. So that is why kahas that represents Torah, represent, I'm sorry, kahas that carries the R and represents Torah, that's why kahas is called kodesh kedoshim. Okay. Now the other two are a little less obvious. Why does Gershon represent Avoda? So this is a bit tricky and a bit uh, metaphorical. Rav Tzadok says, what was Gershon handling? Gershon was handling the curtains, the areos, the tapestries. Now the tapestries form the roof over the Mishkan. Right, the Mishkan are boards and the roof is covered with these tapestries. The roofing is what converts a structure into a bayat, into a home. It is the roof that makes it a bayat. Until there's a roof, there is no bayat. And we always find the, the, the idea of prayer is connected to making someplace a house of Hashem. Hashem describes the Beis HaMikdash, Ki Beisi, Base to fila ye kare lechola amim. My home, my temple, will be a house of prayer for all of the nations. So the concept of bayit, a home for God, is connected to prayer and sacrifice. And since Gershon are carrying that which makes it a bayit, that represents a connection to tefillah, or avoda generally. Now, Merari represents the connection to gemilos chasadim. Why? The Gemara in Sukkah points out that what is the difference between tzedakah and gemilos chesed? Both of them are loving kindness. So one of the differences is tzedakah is with your money. Tzedakah, you write the check. Gemilas chesed is with the physical exertion of your body. So if I give you money to buy food, I've given staka. If I serve you a meal, that's gemilas chesed, which is even greater than staka. So since Marari's job involved the greatest level of physical exertion, schlepping those boards, so that's keneget chesed, which involves the exertion that you put into helping people. So Bekitzer, Rav Sadok's point is that Gershon, Kahas, and Merari, or Kahas, Gershon, and Merari represent Torah, Avoda, Gemilas, Chasadim. But right after Gershon, Kahas, and Merari are counted, we then have a commandment of certain elements that are supposed to be expelled from the Jewish camp. Elements that involve certain levels of impurity. This is called the mitzvah of shiluach tameim. There are three categories of tamei people that have to be expelled from the Jewish camp. The mitzora, the zav, and the tamei nefesh. The mitzora is the person that has leprosy, the Zav is a person with uh, gonorrhea, some type of sexual, sexually transmitted disease. 
And the Tamei Nefesh is simply a person who came in contact with a dead body. Now, these, these are not permanent separations. All three of these have purification rituals. But until there are purification rituals, these three levels of Tuma have to be expelled from different components of Jewish society. This is called Shiluach Tameim. Now, to make things more complicated, however, these three levels of Tuma are expelled from different levels of Machanot, camps. The Jewish camp is divided into three camps. The Mishkan and the courtyard around the Mishkan is called the camp of the Shekhinah, the camp of the Divine Presence. Surrounding the camp of the Divine Presence is where the Levium live, including Moshe and Aaron, Kohanim and Levium, and that is called Machane Lavia. And surrounding them on four sides, right, you had three tribes per side, is called Machane Yisrael. I'll describe a little later uh, how in contemporary terms these things are translated. But let's just look at the midboard to keep it simple. The Mishkan and the courtyard of the Mishkan is Machane Shechina. Machane Shechina is surrounded by Machane Levia. And Machane Levia is surrounded by Machane Yisrael. So listen to the hierarchy. This is a bit complicated. A Mitzora is expelled from all three camps. The Mitzora is even outside of the Machane Yisrael. He is chutz la Machane. He is kind of quarantined or in isolation. The Zav, right, the section of the Ganaria, again, it's, it's only a temporary state, but is separated from the camp of the Divine Presence and the camp of the Levium, if he's a Levi, but he is permitted to reside in Machane Yisrael. And finally, the Tomei Mace, the person who's in contact with a dead body, is not only permitted in Machana Yisrael, but is even permitted in Machana Levi. And the only thing is, he's not allowed to go into Machana Shechina. So the two questions we want to look at, which are related, is number one, what is the deeper spiritual meaning of the expulsion of these three categories of Tuma. And number two, if they are to be expelled, why do they have different gradations of expulsion? Uh, because, you know, a Mitzayra is from all three, a Zav is from two of the three, and a Tomei Meis is only expelled from Machanesh Chinah. Why would that be so? So here, once again, we look to Rav Tzadok, uh, for the insight. And Rav Sadok tells us the following idea. And it's based on Pirkei Avos. Just as Pirkei Avos tells us there are three foundations upon which the world is built. Three foundations of Kedusha. Torah, Avoda, Gemilas Chasadim. Rabbi Elazar HaKapar teaches us there are three negative factors that destroy holiness in the world. And what are those three negative factors? Rabbi Lazar Kapper says, Hakina, jealousy, envy. Taiva, excessive lust for sensual pleasure. And Kavod, a desire for honor or glory. They take a person out of the world. They destroy a person's potential to connect to God. Hakina, Hataiva, Vahakavait, Motsian, Esa Adam in Olam. The altar of Slobodka used to say very beautifully that we shouldn't think that these things only take you away from Olam Haba, although they surely do, but they actually make your life miserable in this world as well. <laughs> I mean, you lose out in both ways. Uh, if I'm jealous, if I'm envious of other people, I never get pleasure in what God has given me. 
And if I'm always seeking more and more taivas to indulge in, I'm not going to be satisfied. And covered, forget about covered. You want covered, you, you'll never get enough covered, right? Uh, somebody uh, compliments you uh, about something you did today. So you're thinking, or you'll say, what about last week? <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> whatever compliment, whatever ego gratification you get is never going to be enough. So Rav Tzadok says, if Torah, Avoda, Gemilas, Chasadim create the framework for holiness, Kina, Taiva, Vekavait create that which destroys goodness, destroys holiness, sucks out the oxygen from the room. You suffocate, you die, you're, you atrophy. Because this just blocks the life-giving forces of closeness to God that can give a person meaning and purpose in life. So here is Rav Sadok says, the three tumot of Mitzorah, Zav, and Tomei Nefesh are physical, or maybe metaphysical manifestations of the character flaws of Kina type of a Kavit. The Mitzorah represents Kina, we'll see why. The Zav represents Taiva. And the Tomei Meis represents Kavot. Again, this may not be so obvious yet, we'll get to it in a minute. But once we understand that when you read Mitzorah, you think Kina. And when you read Zav, you think Taiva. And when you read Tamei Meis, you think Kavite, then you understand when the Torah talks about expelling the tumult, it is actually referring to trying to eradicate those negative forces that undermine Kedusha in our own lives and in the Jewish people as a whole. So let's trace the association. Mitzorah connected to Kina. That's actually fairly simple. I think we talked about it when we looked at the Mitzorah earlier in Chumash Vayikra. Uh, Mitzorah is not a physical, I mean, it's a physical manifestation, but it is not a communicable disease. Maimonides points out, and Maimonides was, of course, a doctor, that the quarantine of a Mitzorah is not because it's contagious in a physical way, but rather, there's a certain spiritual rot in a person that manifests itself in this leprosy, this skin disease. And the primary spiritual blemish is Lashon Hara. That when you speak evil against people, even if it's true, in the time of the Beis Hamikdash, there was a message from God that you got to do tshuva on this to Lashon Hara. Now I'm assuming it was never the case that every, every person who spoke Lashon Hara got saras. If that would be the case, then really almost everybody would have been a Mitzora. In fact, one might even argue either that saras was limited to extreme habitual offenders or the other extreme only to the very righteous that God does not tolerate uh, even a small deviation. I'm not sure it'd be interesting. Uh, if, if there's some place you can go for the vital records of Tsaras to kind of know who got it. You know, I mean, we know Miriam got it. That's one case. She, of course, was obviously a righteous person and a prophet. But we really don't know about that many other people. I mean, there's one case of a non-Jew, Naman, who got Tsaras. But that's a different case. That wasn't the Tsaras of Lashonara. So we know very little about how many people got it and which people got it. But the primary sin which causes the tsarat is Lashon Hara. Now, let's analyze Lashon Hara a little differently. What is the desire on the part of all of us sometimes to say bad things about people, to cut them down to size, to denigrate them, to diminish their achievements? Very often, it will actually be a sense of envy, a sense of jealousy. When somebody seems to be more successful than me, they have more money, more charisma, more friends, more Torah learning. And I feel bad that they're better than me. I don't like to be down here when somebody else is up there. 
So there are two ways of redressing the imbalance. Right? If somebody's up there and you're down here, one way is to try to lift yourself. The other way is to try to pull the other person down. And gravity is an easier force to work with. So, if a, if a Mitzorah commits the sin of Lashon Hara, and if we understand that Lashon Hara is connected ultimately to a sense of jealousy and envy, so we could say the Mitzorah represents the negative force of jealousy. Now, why is the Mitzorah expelled from all three camps? Because jealousy is such a destructive, negative, evil attribute that it doesn't belong in any segment of Jewish society. Not just the holy segments of the Mishkan and Levi, but even ordinary life, which is symbolized by Machane Yisrael. Now again, not that it's easy to eradicate. We, we, we all may have various aspects of envy. In fact, that's the tenth of the Ten Commandments. Do not covet. Very hard one, by the way. And that primarily is, in terms of midot, that primarily says, don't be jealous of what other people have. God has given you what you need. And God has given other people what they need. And to be jealous of what other people have is counterproductive. And if you're jealous because they've achieved something worthy, then your job is to achieve it. But not to begrudge the fact that they've achieved it. So, Mitzayra equals jealousy. Jealousy is really bad. Therefore, it's expelled from all machanot. Now, you may ask me a question. Is it true that jealousy is all bad, that jealousy is totally evil? What about the famous passage in Maseches Bava Basra that says, Kinas Sofrim, Mar Bechachma. What does that mean? The jealousy of Torah scholars increases their wisdom. Competition can be a motivator. Now, granted, it's not the highest motivator. That's called not lishma, not for the sake of God, but okay, Beseder, Chazal say, learn Torah even not for the sake of heaven, because eventually it'll bring you to a good place. So it is a motivator. Uh, this guy finished a tractate, I'm going to finish it too, I'm not going to let him be better than me. It's a motivation, right? So Chazal recognize that a certain degree of healthy competition can motivate people to do better. So in what way is jealousy totally evil? The answer is there are two types of jealousy. A jealousy that motivates me to be better has a place. Although, again, I will add, it's an inferior motivation. Even then, it's an inferior motivation. But I would not call it an evil motivation. It is within the framework of motivations that potentially can lead to something good. But there's another type of jealousy, which is not motivating you to be better but a jealousy in which you desire somebody else to fail. Again, all of us may have it to some degree, even on a subconscious level. But it's evil. It isn't evil. And my job is to try to eradicate it to the whatever, whatever degree we can. In fact, there's all sorts of studies about this in, in social psychology, about uh, sometimes you have a group of people, just give you an example, they decide to go on a diet. Right, a bunch of people who have to go on a diet. And uh, most of them like, stop keeping the diet after a few weeks. But there's one person, usually it usually happens to be women's groups, so there's one woman who keeps on going. And there's all sorts of ways in which the other people who are her friends try to get her off the bandwagon. You know, they say, come on, have a piece of cake. You know, what's so wrong with it? Or, you know, you look emaciated uh, ever since you've been on this diet. And, you know, your whole mood has changed. It used to be nice, you used to be friendly, and now you're a grouch all the time. Now, these are little games that people play in which I feel real bad that I haven't been able to stick with something. And you've been sticking with it. And I'm embarrassed a little bit. I'm humiliated. 
So I want to get you off so we can be friends again. Now, it might be, in this particular case, maybe it's a relatively minor thing, although it's not necessarily minor. Sometimes people really, really have to do this. But it does show that even among friends, we sometimes want people not to be too successful. We want them to fail. And in fact, it's brought down in Svarim. That it's much, you know, there, there's a very big Indian in, G, in Judaism when someone is suffering to have empathy for their suffering. This is called no say be ol es chavero. I share your yoke. You have a burden and I share your yoke with you. It's a beautiful, important thing. We'll call that empathy. But it's brought down that as great as this madrega is, this level is, it is easier to commiserate in someone's suffering than to rejoice in their good fortune. An amazing thing. You're suffering, my heart goes out to you. When you're successful, it's a little harder for me to deal with if I'm not in that place. Okay? And that comes from that idea of jealousy that, that we all have to some degree. Listen, if it wouldn't be a problem, the Torah wouldn't have legislated it. That's why the Torah says, don't covet. Precisely because it is our nature to be jealous. So, therefore, there are two types of jealousy. There might, there might be what you call good jealousy, although that's still inferior, but it's a, something you can go with. And that's the jealousy that motivates me to be better. But then there's destructive jealousy in which I want people to fail so I don't look bad or I don't feel bad. And the Mitzayra represents, I want to cut that guy down to size. Therefore, the Mitzayra is expelled from all three machanas. But then we come to the Zav. Now, the Zav's connection to Taiva is fairly obvious. After all, Ziva is a gonorrheal disease, sexually transmitted disease. So usually that'll come from an overabundance of sexual partners uh, and the like. Uh, so we could say the Zav represents taiva, lust. But here is the thing. Lust is actually more complicated than jealousy. With jealousy, as hard as it is to get rid of, and it is hard, I could say unequivocally, the jealousy of wanting somebody to fail is totally invalid, totally bad, it has no makam. Our relationship to taiva is a bit more equivocal and ambiguous. Because a certain amount of connection to the pleasures of the world is actually necessary for survival. I have to eat. I have to sleep. There is a mitzvah of husband and wife to be intimate and have sexual pleasure. And by the way, that's not only for procreation, although that's true. There's an independent obligation of giving pleasure to each other. That's an important point in Judaism, by the way. Uh, sex is not only, or sexual intercourse is not only as a means to have children, but it's part of the uh, nature of a marriage itself. And the Rambam even writes that physical pleasure has a psychological dimension. When a person lives in comfortable surroundings, they are calmer. Their spirit gets replenished they're able to serve God better because they're, they're, having, they're living with less tension. Right? The Rambam talks about the role of aesthetics in life, whether it be art or whether it be music or whether it be taking a vacation or looking at you know, nature, looking at the Grand Canyon or trees or orchards or plants and the like. So God wants us to get pleasure from the physical world. In point of fact, uh, we, we read in the same Parsha, Parsha Snaso, about the Nazar, the one who takes a vow to abstain from wine, that the Nazar has to bring a sacrifice. And Rashi says, because he committed a sin by being a Nazar, because he's abstaining from a legitimate pleasure that God wanted him to have. The Talmud Yerushalmi actually says, quite astoundingly, don't tell your kids, they'll use it against you, that after 120 years we are going to be held to account for every permissible pleasure of this world that we could have enjoyed 
permissible pleasure that we didn't enjoy because God said, I put it here for you. Why did you reject the beauty and the joy and the pleasure that I wanted you to have? An amazing thing. Rav Shimshon of Hirsch used to say, of course he lived near the Alps and he lived in Germany, he said that God is going to ask everybody, did you enjoy my Alps? Did you enjoy the majesty of my Alps? I put them there so you would enjoy it. How could you not even look at it? How could you ignore it? So, on one hand, pleasure is necessary and pleasure is even desirable. It's a way of enhancing our love and appreciation to God for the beautiful world that he created. So what's the problem? The problem is when it becomes an end in and of itself. You know the old saying, it's okay for you to own possessions, but it's not okay for your possessions to own you. And that is, if I take my possessions, my physical pleasures, and I use them to enhance my appreciation of God and my gratitude in the world, then they become a beautiful way of augmenting your mitzvahs. If on the other hand, your mind and your soul and your yearnings are fixated in those physical pleasures, whether it be food or money or uh, intercourse, or drugs, or alcohol, whatever it would be, whatever it would be, then you've taken something that should be a means of enhancing your connection to Hashem. And you're doing the opposite. <coughs> so taiva is bad, but taiva does have a place <coughs> in life. And within a certain degree of moderation, it's good. So this is symbolized in the following way. Machane Yisrael the camp of the Israelites, represents ordinary society. Regular people. For regular people, some connection to taiva is a good thing. They eat and they drink and they enjoy. But, as you graduate in spiritual levels, right, the levy is the full-time servant of God. And Kalvachomer, when you achieve communion with God, that state of ecstasy, you no longer are involved in the physical. But let me explain this. This is an important point. Not because of some self-conscious strategy of renunciation or asceticism, but simply because you've graduated beyond what you might regard as childish. Just as an adult, at some point, gives up playing, most adults at least, gives up playing with children's toys, not because they've decided, hey, I'm an adult and I'm not supposed to uh, play with Legos. Although Legos might not be a good example, you can do things as an adult with Legos, but whatever it would be. You see, it's not like, I am renouncing my connection to children's toys. It's like an automatic process. I'm so connected to things that are more important than that. That they just don't interest me anymore. That's how it works with taiva. It's not that I'm not going to eat this cake because I don't want to be a bal taiva. Although some people act that way, but that's not really what appropriate asceticism is. It's a different thing. I'm so connected to Torah. I'm so connected to mitzvahs that these things don't interest me anymore. I'm just not interested. It's kind of a developmental process. And that's why the Zav that represents Taiva does have admission in ordinary life. But as you graduate in levels, you simply are less interested in it. So let's hear of Chaim Kineski. Good example. Chaim Kineski was the prototype of the person who devoted all of his energies to the mastering of the Torah and of course helping Klal Yisrael as well that, that those are the, his two projects in life so it's not like he made some decision not to have luxuries 
It just, it didn't matter to him. It didn't make a difference. It was not important to him. That's the Levi and the Shekhinah in which the Zav gets distance. They tell the story about the Shagas Aryeh, who was one of the great, great Achronim, that legend has it, it may be a legend, I don't know if it's true, that he actually died because a bookcase full of heavy books toppled over. And he was crushed by the books. Legend has it that the books were taking a revenge because he was a very independent commentator and he often argued against earlier authorities and those earlier authorities took their vengeance by falling upon him and killing him. So he broke his back and uh, in his last moments on earth he asked someone to hold a Talmud over his eyes so he could learn, go through the whole Talmud one more time before he died. Just turn the pages, you know, like speed reading the Talmud. Uh, now the truth is, I'm sure the Sagasari knew it by heart, but he still wanted to read the Talmud one last time. So this was Lithuania, they were pretty tough people. So one of the people said to him, you figure someone's dying, you, you express a little compassion or whatever. Someone said, you know, you're about to die, now is not the time to go over the Talmud, you should confess your sins and do tshuva before you die, so you will leave the world in a state of purity. They, they were tough in those days. So the Shagas Aryeh responded and he said, it's not that I was so righteous that I never sinned. He said, I'm not so righteous. He says, I just never had time to get to it. I mean, I was busy. I was just busy. I was busy learning. I was busy doing mitzvahs. I didn't have time. And that's kind of... I didn't have time for the ice cream. Not that, you know, I renounced the ice cream. I just didn't have time. I was doing something else. You know? Okay. So that's... I think yeah. when, Abram, when, used, when they murdered him, he used the marshal of children. They asked him, what are you going to... When he comes to Shemai, he said... Yeah. I think he used the marshal of a child, though. It's going to be like someone stole a child's food. Right, 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 right. In fact, I, I, I just, just today I actually heard, you know... Um, we actually uh, lost uh, a very, very great person, a very interesting person this week, Uri, Rabbi Uri Zohar, Zechorno Levracha. And Uri Zohar is a fascinating, amazing story. Uh, he was the Johnny Carson of, of Israel. He was like the most successful comedian in Israel, probably in Israeli history. Uh, movies, TV, uh, you know, live performances, everything, everything, everything. And he was totally unreligious and he lived quite a licentious lifestyle as well. And then at some point, he became like ultra-Orthodox Haredi, he did Shuvah. The world was shocked. The world was absolutely shocked. Um, and I, I, I saw an interview, so he, he died at 86. He just died a few days ago. So they're replaying different interviews that people had with him over the years. And uh, there was someone interviewing him that's saying like, um, how does the Rabbi Uri Zohar now look at the old Uri Zohar then? Do you look at him like a bad person, a negative person, like you want to make believe he never existed? And he said, no, he says, that was, he was a nice guy. He was a good guy. And I'm not cutting myself off from him. In fact, you, you can see actually he still is a very, he still was a very witty and funny person, although he had to kind of conceal it a little bit. Uh, but he said, it was like a child. I look at my past the way an adult looks at his childhood. Yeah. I enjoyed my childhood, I had a good time, I had friends, but I was a child. And I grew up, and I matured, and I realized that life has responsibilities. That's it. So I don't look at myself as an evil person. I look at myself as a child who grew up. And it's a very interesting point. That that's what it is. I just became an adult. Although, fascinatingly, he had a partner who was also a great comedian, Eric uh, Einstein. And Eric Einstein was, uh, not, did not become religious. But interestingly, Eric Einstein's kids became religious. And Uri Zohar's sons, two sons, married two daughters of Eric Einstein. And therefore they share grandchildren together. And he said that he loves Eric Einstein, even though Eric Einstein is not religious, but he loves him. He, sp he speaks to him, he spoke to him, well, I'm not alive anymore, but he spoke to him every week. <laughs> and uh, it's fascinating. And Eric Einstein is kind of thrilled that he has these religious 
children and grandchildren, although uh, you know, he's not a religious person himself, but it's an amazing type of unity within the uh, different segments of, of Israeli, Israeli society. But be it as it may, that's the analogy of the childhood. Okay, so that's why, so now you understand, that's why the Mitzorah, which is jealousy, is expelled from all three camps. That's why the Zav, which is Taiva, does gain admission in ordinary life, but not in Machina Levia or Machina Shechina. We now come to the Tame Mes. Now Tame Mes simply means the one that's in contact with a dead body. Tame for seven days need to be sprinkled with the ashes. This is the only Tuma that needs to be sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer. The other Tumas do not need that sprinkling. How is that connected to Kovot? So this again is a little less obvious, but keep in mind that Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava, were supposed to live forever. Death came into the world because of the sin of the eight sadas, eating the, tree, uh, the fruit from the tree of, of knowledge. How did the nachash entice Chava and then Chava enticed Adam to eat from that fruit? What was the selling point? So Rav Sadok says the selling point was the day that you eat from this fruit you will be like God with a knowledge and a mastery of good and evil. A very, very mysterious and deep idea. But essentially, it was mar just looking at it in terms of gross marketing, it was marketed as a God pill, which is the ultimate ego trip. Imagine, I give you a pill and say, take this pill and you'll be God. But God doesn't want you to take it. Yeah, but so what? If I take it, I'm God. So, right, who cares at that point? I'm God too. Now, in many, many ways, we are godlike. Can't deny it. We are made, but Selim Elohim. We are made in the image of God. We have creativity. We have autonomy. We have power. We have an ability to manipulate nature in all sorts of ways. We can fight and cure disease. We can drain swamps, create technologies. We have godlike abilities in many ways. But the ultimate reminder that we're not God is, immortali is mortality. Mortality is the ultimate chasm between creator and created. And therefore, it was the arrogance, the hubris of man that brought death into the world. Not so much as a punishment, but as a reminder. And in fact, uh, we'll talk about this in another share, but this is why the purification rituals of death involve humility, ashes, which are a sign of humbleness, uh, immersion in a mikvah, which is returning to the womb in an infantile state. All of them are kind of the metaphor in Greek mythology of the phoenix bird that rises from the ashes. <clears throat> that it's precisely my humility and submission that gives me life. By the way, although I, I just said it was a Greek myth, in fact, it is also a medrash. And the Greek might have got it from the medrash. Uh, that is the net spurt, is the same idea, that it's burnt into ashes and then it rises from the ashes. So, every time I encounter death, I am reminded of the reason for death. Kavod, arrogance, gaiva. And therefore, when death is expelled from the machane, it means kavod is expelled. But here is the thing. Our relationship to Kavod is even more complicated than our relationship to Taiva. Kina, get rid of it if you can. Taiva has a place in ordinary life, but as you spiritually mature, you're less connected to it. Kavod, I'll say two things about Kavod. On one hand, being too preoccupied with kavod is the worst possible thing you can do. The Gemara in Sota tells us that God hates 
the Baal Gaiva. God hates the arrogant. God hates the prideful. Mishle says, Toavas Hashem. Call Gavay Lev. He or she who is arrogant in heart is an abomination in the eyes of God. The Gemara even says that the world is not big enough for Hashem and the Baal Gaiva to live in this world and therefore Hashem leaves. Hashem leaves. So on one hand, kavod, seeking kavod is the worst possible midah you can have. On the other hand, it may be the most important thing that you need in your spiritual life. Kavod means, in a good way, I recognize my worth. I see my value. I identify that God gave me abilities. And I have to use my abilities in a positive, constructive way. If a person does not have a sense of their worth, if a person does not have a sense of basic self-esteem, they'll never do mitzvahs because they'll figure, what's the point? Why would God be interested in my learning, my davening, my chesed? You see, humility, we mentioned this last week, does not mean a denial of my essential worth. It just means I know that my worth comes because God gave me abilities that I have to use in a good way. But when Moshe is the humble, most humble of all people, that doesn't mean he thought he was stupid. He knew who he was. But he knew that it was a gift from God to be used in, in the right way. So, kavot not only is necessary for ordinary life, but even in the life of the levy, which is spiritual aspiration, you need to have a sense of kavot I matter. I'm important. The only thing is, when you reach the ultimate level of communion to Hashem, the Vekos, then you can leave your ego behind. Because at that point, this is really a level that even the great Sadiqim may not achieve. But when you achieve a total oneness with God, there is no longer a sense of your separate identity. So you no longer think about I'm significant, I'm important. You don't think about the I at all. This is what Hasidus call Beetle Hayesh, the nullification of the self. Or even a higher level, Beetle Hametzias, the negation of existence. But there's a long way till you get to that. In ordinary spiritual life of even the Levi, you need the Kavot. I matter. I make a difference. And therefore, if I can make a difference, I must make a difference. The great Rav Yerucham of Mir, one of the great, great Bali Musar, used to say that the person who is not aware of his faults is a foolish person. I think I'm perfect. You know, I'm pretty delusional. But a person who is not aware of their inner greatness is a tragic person because they will never know. They won't have the tools to become who they're supposed to become. They'll never become who they really are. They'll never be aware of who they were destined to be. And this is something that we have to know for ourselves and we have to communicate to our children. How many people go through life never aware of the potential of what they could have been? And by the way, I'm not talking about necessarily to be famous or whatever. I'm not even referring to that. I'm just referring within the parameters of their private life. The person they could have become. The life that Hashem wanted them to have and the life that Hashem created the framework so they would have but they never latched onto it because they thought it was beyond them it wasn't for them and that's a tragedy it's not just a foolishness it's a tragedy and therefore kavod tamemes equals kavod 
not only comes into Machna Yisrael, but even into Machna Leviya. It just, Machna Shechina is a different level. That's when you have a total union with the divine. At that point, there is no ego issue that comes into mind at all. You're just one with God. And that's a level that maybe only the greatest, the greatest, the greatest tzaddikim may have. Again, the Tanya talks about this. Bitul Hayesh, Bitul HaMetzias, these are madregas that are not really within our normal frame of, frame of reference. Okay? So this is Rav Sadok's very, very beautiful explanation. When the Chazinish died in 1953, I think it was 53, so Rabbi Dessler was the mashkiach of the Panovich Yeshiva. Rabbi Dessler, uh, you may know his, his famous forum, Mikhtav Melio, published after his death, Strive for Truth, it's like a, a six volumes, one of the, one of the beautiful, beautiful uh, books on uh, Jewish uh, ethical philosophy. So Rev Dessler uh, was uh, from, well he was from Lithuania, then he was in England uh, during the World War II, and then he eventually came over to Eretz Yisrael, and he was the mashkiach of Panovich, the great Panovich Yeshiva. And at the Chazinish Levaya, there was a boy that was crying, sobbing, and Rev Dessler went over to the boy and said to the boy, why are you crying? over the Rav, the Gon, and the Tzaddik that's buried in the ground, the Chazanesh. He then pointed to the boy. Why don't you cry over the Rav, the Gon, and the Tzaddik that's buried within you? Because the Rav, the Gon, and the Tzaddik that's buried in the ground <laughs> became the person he was supposed to become. But what about you? What about the greatness in you? What about the potential in you? Maybe that's something to cry about a little bit more than the people who kind of self-realize uh, their life. Right, so that's, uh, that's I think, is Rav Sadek's beautiful message. Now let me just add, just to make this a little more contemporary, we have these three halachic areas. We have the camp of the Shekhinah, we have the camp of the Leviim, Levia, and we have the camp of the uh, Yisrael. Now, today, because we don't have the red heifer, all of us who have ever been in a cemetery, we're all tummy mess. The other tumas, we, we, well, generally there aren't any real lepers today, saras today, and zav, maybe yes, maybe not, but most people are not a zav either. So it turns out that the average Jewish person today, the only disability they have in terms of tuma is tummy mess. Now, a Tame Met is only prohibited to enter the camp of the Shekhinah. What is the camp of the Shekhinah in modern times? So, the short answer would be, the camp of the Shekhinah would be the Beis HaMikdash and the courtyard around the Beis HaMikdash. Anything beyond that on the Temple Mount is Machna Leviya. So, technically, the Temple Mount, the outer portion of the Temple Mount, is only the camp of Levi. The inner portion of the Temple Mount would become the camp of the Shekhinah. So, when we ask the halachic question, I'm, I'm being very oversimplistic here, but I just want to bring out what the problem is. Am I allowed to go in the Temple Mount halachically? The short answer is, if my only problem is Tumat Met, I would be allowed to go to the outer perimeter of the Temple Mount, which is Machina Lavia, but I cannot go into the inner part of the Temple Mount because that would be Machina Shechina, and the definition of inner and outer would simply be where would the courtyard of the Temple be, and that would define it as the inner. So, there are those people, particularly in the, the Dati Liumi, the religious Zionist camp, who do go to the Temple Mount, and they follow this practice of the outer part, not the inner part, because they are confident that they can identify where the Beit HaMikdash would have been, and based on their identification, they could say, this is not the prohibited area. But it's no secret that, and again, I'm not giving you a psaac, I'm just reporting, that most of the Haredi world uh, takes the position that you are not allowed to go in any part of the Temple Mount, and this is a rare instance 
where the government and the Haredim are in agreement, albeit for different reasons. The government is concerned with provocation and causing riots. So the government doesn't like people going to the Temple Mount. But the Haredim basically say that we look at it as a minefield, that we're not sufficiently well-versed as to where the Beit HaMikdash was located, that we could say this is outer, this is inner. So the point I'm making is, there's not really a machlokas regarding principle here. Everybody admits in principle there is an area of the Temple Mount that a Tomei Mei can go. And everybody admits in principle that there's an area of the Temple Mount that a Tomei Mei cannot go. And the question simply is, how confident are you willing to be in your identification of those areas? Now, I do want to point out, however, that uh, certain types of tumult are analogous to the Zav Tuma, and they cannot go into Machna Levia. That would be a man that had a seminal emission, even if it wasn't gonorrhea, and a woman that's Anita. So even if you permit entry to the Harabayat for Tomei Met, the outer part of the Harabayat, you would not permit entry for a woman that is Anita, or a man that had a seminal emission. Yeah, but then you can go to the mikvah. The, the, the problem is Tomei Met, you can't remove without paraduma. The other two modes can be removed by mikvah and the like. Uh, but since uh, single women who have already started menstruating do not go to the mikvah today, so there's no way halachically that a single girl who's already had her period would be allowed to go in any part of the Arabite. So that's an important thing to keep in mind, that the outer inner distinction is only a machina shechina definition, which is relevant for Tomei Met. But once you're dealing with uh, Nida or Balkari, seminal emission, at that point the whole Harabayat is going to be prohibited because the Harabayat is Machna Levia. Now you may ask me, we don't have Hashem, we don't have Mitzoras today, but what is called the Israelite camp? So interestingly, it doesn't mean every place Jews live. It's only walled cities. Uh, so the, the, the old city would have the Halacha, a Mitzora would have to be, could not live in the old city. But outside, a Mitzorah could live in Tel Aviv and B'nai Brak and even uh, perhaps parts of Yerushalayim. Huh? In Baka, even in Baka. Right. So it's interesting that this changes the picture a little bit. We, we, we tended to envision the Mitzorah as being quarantined. In fact, it wasn't so strict a quarantine as you would assume. It just barred him from the walled cities. And he could live uh, in Baca. He could live in Baca. He could have a Dira here in Baca. And people could visit him. So that kind of changes the picture a little bit. So I just wanted to make it contemporary. He has to announce. So he's, um, he, he, yeah, so people aren't going to hang out with him. That's true. Because they don't want to become Tame. But he doesn't have to be in total, in total isolation. Okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to share with you. And I wish you all a uh, good week. And thank you for coming. <laughs> Amen.